so happy Tuesday, you guys. We made it through another Monday, and I have a very fun guest today. Um, Michael, I actually stumbled upon your Instagram profile and just found it to be super interesting because it's all about investing, making money, like being your own boss, taking advantage of the real estate market, which I think everyone wants to do. Everyone thinks is easy. A handful of people seem to have figured it out. And I get a lot of questions about that. So when I was looking at your page, I thought this is going to be really fun. Um, hopefully very informative. Um, so how about just give everyone that's listening a little bit of your like bona fides, what you used to do, what you didn't want to do anymore, how you got into investing um, in the nutshell, and then we'll dive deeper. Yeah, well, I'll try to make it as brief as I can. But uh, I was a college athlete, um, graduated in 2015. Uh, I had redshirted a year due to an injury. I was hoping to get drafted. I played baseball, didn't pan out. So uh, I had turned down a job offer from an internship I did the year before, and here I am with a high GPA finance degree uh, with no job, and I'm deciding if I want to go back to school or not. So um, I was working uh, a sales job for like a startup company called Hulix Medical. It was an awful product. Didn't make a single sale going door to door at doctor's offices in South Florida in the heat of the summer. Oh. And I was like, I have to make money to at least pay for gas and stuff. I applied to like 20 different service jobs. No one would hire me. I got to a final interview at Dunkin' Donuts in Chipotle. Chipotle didn't hire me. Like so on the Dunkin line Donuts or management? Like what are we talking wage. here? Talking like on the line. I was overqualified. You're overqualified, more qualified yeah. On paper, at least. Yeah. To, <laughs> on to, paper, at least. I like that place, caveat. Let alone on pouring coffee. Yeah, on paper, at least. And I was like, man, that's a gut punch. Like, I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy, you know? But, anyways, did that. It was fine. I was like, I'm just going to go back to school and, and play last year of baseball and have fun. Um, and then got into, you know, the real world, real world, quote unquote, uh, I was working an entry level sales job, cold calling every day, making $35,000 a year. Ugh, when I signed so that contract, hard. I was like, man, this is a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like, this sucks. Yeah. So that was my first taste of, I guess the rat race, if you will, I would just drive home and I would almost feel numb. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't enjoy what I'm doing every day, but I'm told to just work hard and climb the corporate ladder and make money and I'll be happy. And I wasn't. Um, so that got me interested in reading books, watching YouTube, listening to podcasts like this and, you know, uncovered this term financial freedom or financial independence. And I became obsessed with that. I'm like, how can I, how can I find a way to make passive income? Looked at all these different ways. Um, and at the time, so much of it was over my head. The only thing that made sense to me was real estate. And I was like, okay, that, that makes logical sense. Buy a property somehow, rent it out and, and you know, income minus expenses. That's my take home. Mm -hmm. That's cash flow. So started to save up for a few years, um, and uh, I was getting ready probably in 2018 or 19 to buy uh, like a duplex or something, like like everyone's first mm -hmm. property, right? Single family home, long term rental, and then stayed in a couple short term rentals in the process of moving from Austin to Nashville. And I was like, wait a minute, how much are these people making on on Airbnb? You're like, I know how much I spent. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I started to do the math. I'm like, if they're only renting like 20 days a month at this price, it can't, their mortgage or their rent can't be more than X, um, some expenses. I was like, this is ridiculous if it's true. So I became obsessed with it um, and then bought my first short-term rental with my wife, Jill, at the end of 2019. And in the third month, this is in Nashville, Tennessee, we were set to cash flow over like seven grand in a single month. That was like the most eye-opening experience of my life. And I was like, I'm all yeah. in. Then COVID hit, which we can get into in a little bit, and we kind of pivoted our strategy at the time a little bit. But um, we've had a kind of a crazy few years. We both quit our jobs, became financially free in like 12 months, quit our jobs after 16 months in 2021, traveled in a camper van for a year, um, now have six short-term rentals under contract for a seventh, arbitraging one now as well, so it'd be eight total. Um, and I've developed, I don't know, several other businesses along the way, just mm -hmm. doing social media content, which is how you found yeah. me. So it's been a wild ride three or four years ago. I would never have predicted where I'm well, at. Well, And I feel like um, you so. are living what a lot of people like, it was obviously that, you know, financial independence, financial freedom, I think is the majority of people's dream. Um, but particularly the way you did it and the amount of time with the, the lifestyle it seems to provide it to you is, is it's, that's the dream. Like, I, I've still got 10 bosses and I theoretically work for myself. Um, so I'm just super interested because everyone wants to be able to do that, but most people don't achieve it. And I think there's some easy like, okay, well, the problem is you're lazy or the problem is you can't do the same thing every day. And this requires some amount of, um, you know, structure. 
but there so there's some very concrete things also I think some things that are a little bit more intangible um, so I want to break down that nutshell just a little bit more really to help people get some takeaways whether it's they want to get into real estate for financial freedom or they're launching their own business or you know they're s selling a product for someone else and want to want to be their own boss um, but specifically I think the biggest hurdle I hear from so many people is buying buying the first property like where am I supposed to get this money not everyone has you know this great job where they can save money or they have these expenses so they can't and I think sometimes those questions are legitimate and I think sometimes it's a way for us to kind of make excuses for ourselves so we have someone to blame or some situation to blame other than ourselves but it sounds like you weren't I don't know you might have family money I, I don't but it sounds like you were working for saving for um, that first investment so if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and whether you like leveraged a loan or it was all cash, what was, what was that like um, in the conversation for you and your wife? Yeah, for sure. So um, I've, any investment my wife and I have ever done have been self-funded, first of all. We both come from you know solid families, like financially stable and everything like that, but we've never leveraged um, family money for anything, which is, which is awesome. Um, so my wife and I, first of all, you have to be on the same page as your spouse or significant other, 100%. It makes, one, it more fun to like chase like life goals together. Um, but two, it just it makes things so much easier. Like conversations are easier, decisions are easier to be made if, if you both have the same end state of being or end goals in mind. Um, we had saved up for a while and I realized early on in my sales career that I could not save my way to financial freedom or save my way. So for me, it was, fo and I think I've heard this on books, podcasts, YouTube, whatever it is, but focus on earning more or focus on income, whether that's side hustling, changing jobs, get into a different type of sales role where you're in charge of your destiny, right? We you're talk about selling feet pics on OnlyFans quite a lot. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. do what you got to do. Yeah. You do what you got to do. That's right. But if you could take a little bit more control over your income, especially if your dream state of being is not a job, or a career, if your goal is financial freedom, like don't be so caught up in like job hopping. Like I changed jobs three different times in four years. Um, so it was pretty, pretty quick because I could level up my income. And that, that for me, that was, oh, I could start investing that much faster, that much more into the next property. So the first property we got was $495,000 uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, you don't have to start with that much. We did a 15% down uh, in conventional investment loan. And then we had to furnish it you know, short term rentals, you have to furnish the place nicely if you want to do well. And I was like, oh, crap, I didn't really forgot about that. You know, 15,000 right there. <laughs> 30,000. 30. 30 OK. And mm -hmm. so I think we had maybe 10 or 12 extra. And I was like, OK, I'm going to sell my truck that I just finished paying off. It was a dream truck. Shouldn't have bought it in the first place. But good learning lesson. Um, Side note, in, people, a uh, vehicle is never a good investment, rarely a good investment. No. Nowadays, trucks do tend to hold their value at least, but nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I traded it in, got an old Honda CRV, which I hated, but it, it helped us pay for the furniture and get that place launched. Mm -hmm. So that was our, our journey into that first one. Yeah. We definitely leveraged a mortgage, which we have with all of our properties uh, to this point in time. So you were able to leverage um, a mortgage because you and your wife both had at that time your, you know, your your big kid jobs, your stable jobs where you got a paycheck every other week. Um, when I started my my first investment, it was a twelve thousand dollar house. Uh, it was a HUD house and I couldn't do something that was close to half a million because I was waiting tables. So I didn't have stable enough income. I hadn't established enough credit. So I, I just want to point that out for people who will hear your side of the story and say like, oh, okay, well, they had established credit. They could do a loan. It's doable other ways. It's, sure. I think the way you did it is preferred because you were able to jump bigger quicker than I was for sure. But it, it's not, it's not the only way people. So don't get, um, don't get bummed out. Yeah, for sure. Time. And also there's the cool thing with short-term rentals that was fascinating to me. And I wish I started earlier than waiting and saving and working and saving more, right? Or selling my truck. And that's through a strategy called rental arbitrage, which a lot of people start out with. I mean, you could start with 10 or $15,000. Uh, rental arbitrage, you're basically just gaining permission from a landlord or a homeowner. That's what I was going to gonna ask you. I've heard a lot about this. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's, I've seen people start with no money. For example, one kid I worked with was a 22 year old, just graduated college working of unpaid internship. 
and I was working with him. He lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm like, look, do you work with somebody who has six to ten thousand dollars that they'll throw you if you can present a return that's like a fifty percent ROI for them? And he's like, yes. I said, okay, go to Charlotte, look at the apartments that are already on Airbnb, find ones that look similar. Those ones allow corporate leasing. Call the landlord and pitch them this. And he did. And then he took the spreadsheet I gave him. And it was like 120% ROI because there's no down payment or closing costs. The ROI is ridiculous. It's just furniture and pitch it to pitch it to your boss. And the guy threw money at him. He got three properties with no money out of pocket doing rental arbitrage. And he's taking like a 20% management fee. And that was how he got his foot in the door. So there so are to dumb ways it down, to like rental arbitrage is finding a property that you're not going to buy. It's saying, okay, so I live in downtown Indy um, or I live wherever in Indy. There is, we have a huge convention center. I'm going to find an apartment complex downtown Indy. I'm going to rent an apartment. First, check and make sure you're allowed to sublease it. I'm going to rent this apartment, and then I'm going to manage it as an Airbnb. And then you pretty much manage that, you know, and and upcharge because you're renting it for, let's say, in, you know, in downtown Indianapolis, $2,000. And you are booking it at $150 a night for X amount of nights. You're gonna, that, that, that gap is where you get to make the money. And because he didn't even have the money to furnish it, you're saying this guy got an investor and he was just kind of the manager exactly, of yeah. the Airbnb. But, yeah, but you're spot on with rental arbitrage. Like okay. let's say you had 10,000, you get a one bedroom apartment. Let's say it's first and last month's rent up front. That's 2,000 right? You said for, for rent, so it'd be 4k. And let's say you spend five, five to 6k on furniture, you're all in for nine or 10 grand. Mm -hmm. And that place will probably cash flow you one to maybe $2,000 a month on busier months. I mean, you make your money back in six to 10 months and, and then you could just rinse and repeat and get another one and another one, another one. So that's how people snowball with starting with very little, which is why rental arbitrage and the whole Airbnb model is fascinating. uh, Because you don't have to buy. Exactly. Yeah. You're basically hacking the system. You're, uh-huh. you, you reap the benefits of cash flow without the down payment or closing costs. Now, you don't get the added benefit of owning, like depreciation. Uh, you don't get principal pay down the loan cap. So, all of those other benefits that you get by owning, you don't get. But the scalability and the, the cash on cash return is, is substantially higher with an arbitrage. Yeah. You're not paying sure. property taxes. Uh, depending on the apartment complex, you're not paying. Trash removal, snow, you know, snow removal, utilities, things like that. Um, that's super interesting. What have you found? Because I just started learning about this probably like three weeks ago. Um, and my first thought was, okay, I have rentals. And I had one tenant in a quadplex say, hey, remember when we talked about that I could Airbnb my unit? And it's, it's, it's a long-term rental. And I said, no. First of all, we did not talk about that. So that's why it's important. I think what you're saying is to make sure it's allowable in the lease, not just subleasing, but subleasing uh, short term, I think is an important um, definition to clarify. But he he wanted to do that. And for me, because I was smaller scale and have rentals, like, no, I'm the one that's making money. If I wanted to Airbnb it, I'll Airbnb it. But it sounds like the the places to go after are those bigger apartment buildings that aren't one person like all they want to do is get their monthly rent they don't care about the rest they're not interested in short-term leasing they're not interested in furnishing so they don't care that you're doing that extra legwork yeah yeah true and and i guess i'll flip it on you because i've had several people i've been on podcasts that say the same thing that own a lot of uh, long-term rentals um like I guess one, my question for you is if you could Airbnb at one, why aren't you already? If I'm mm-hmm. approaching you as an arbitrage two, like I want to craft a financially beneficial or mutual mutually uh, beneficial relationship for both of us, right? And I'm going to be the best renter you've ever rented to. One, rent's always going to be paid on time. Not that you have an issue with that currently, but it will be. Um, two, I would like to sign a multi-year lease, not just a 12 month. What's your highest cost? Probably turnover and vacancy for yep. most landlords. Yep. I can eliminate that for you. Assuming my business is going well. The third thing is professional cleaning and, and just constant maintenance. Like we have people go in there and clean between every group of guests. So oftentimes that's five to 10 times a month. Yep. Um, so the property will stay in for sale condition. If you ever wanted to list your property for sale, you could come show it on any given day of the week in between guests and it will be perfect. So those are like the three key benefits um, that I would personally recommend pitching. Like you want to make sure that you're you're honestly doing the landlord a favor too. If all they want to do is is their typical strategy is a long term rental and have a really good tenant that always pays and keeps the unit in good condition, 
I'm going to be the best tenant you've ever had. So you have to make sure you're crafting the conversation to go yeah, in. Yeah, and like, that's the hey, big Mina, difference. Let me the way you, it. <laughs> yeah, no, the way you just said that, I would have been like, yeah, okay, bro, I'm going to up your rent like a couple hundred bucks, but have Worth have it. a party. Um, but there was no pitch behind it. It was just like, I'm going to Airbnb mm. this so I can make some money. And I'm like, what? why are you making money off my property? <laughs> right. Whereas yeah, the way you, you present it, right? it yeah. makes way more sense. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, that was that. Yes. But I think if you can't even make the pitch the way you did, you definitely can't run the business model the way you think that, that it could be ran where it would actually benefit me in that way. So probably not the right person to do it. Um, but still a very interesting business model because that was my immediate thought process. Then the second one was, okay, what like what other landlords would let you do this? But when you when you spin it that way, it actually does make sense because the reason I long term rent, my husband and I did at the time, was because I didn't have I'm gonna say this now and we feel stupid even saying it, I didn't have the time to manage it being short term, whereas I could have outsourced the management ness, but he was working corporate full time. I'm always running around like a chicken with my head cut off. So I felt like I didn't have the time to do it well. My husband has since quit his corporate job. He manages our portfolio and we are, are going to do, we're, we're in the process of building um, a quadplex that I'm, I'm currently debating, you know, splitting part long term, part short term versus doing all short term. Um, so I'm interested to hear a little bit more about your thought process and theory on, okay, go all short term. This is, you know, the upfront costs are maybe a little bit more, but X, Y, Z in the long term. Or do you feel that there's something to that balance for people to have this long term stable income versus short term Airbnb, particularly given what we went through the last handful of years with COVID and how that affected your business and what you did to pivot and not, you know, have the bottom fall out? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess in one perspective is if you're in an urban area uh, that has business, there's constant influx of people moving into the city and out of the city. And maybe if there's healthcare too, there's always an opportunity to pivot from a furnished short-term rental to a midterm rental, like think travel nurse, Mm -hmm. insurance people coming in for three months or getting relocated for work. They need a place to stay where they're building a home um, three to six months at a time or a furnished long-term rental. You can always pivot backwards into that. Um, There's always somebody looking for a place to rent. Um, as far as COVID is concerned, it did hammer most urban areas for like at least 12 months, some longer, some less. Uh, but Nashville, like I said, we were set to cashless $7,000 that third month. We had $40,000 of cancellations in like seven days. Oh, and geez. Airbnb was like, I think they were trying to do the right thing, but it's kind of like they really screwed all the hosts that helped build that billion multi-billion dollar business. Um, they overrode all of our cancellation policies without questions asked, without oh, regard to so how the host even if it affected. was a, a booking that was supposed to come in tomorrow and your, yours said you have to pay in full, they were like, nope, everyone's getting forgiven. Yep. They pulled the carpet out from every single host. There's class action lawsuits. I thought I had it bad. And then I spoke with the guy who built my home who owns like, I don't know, 100. He's like, yeah, we had like 1.7 million in cancellations. Oh my and he God. was like, I'm suing Airbnb. I'm suing my property manager. I'm like, oh boy, like, all right, I'll shut my mouth. I don't have yeah, any Yeah, okay. Yeah, with that being <laughs> I'll take said, my $40,000 loss yeah. and Yeah, <laughs> but that was here. like the worst thing I think that could have happened to the travel industry in recent history. And in Nashville, we were only two months cash flow negative on that property for that entire year. And we're still okay. cash flow positive for the year. Yeah. So even looking at back at that, I'm like, okay, there's still a way to, to make money as a short-term rental. And we didn't even pivot to long-term. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we did do is we bought another place in Nashville in May of that year as like COVID was really hitting. So, uh, but what we did is pivot to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Smoky Mountains, and more vacation style markets where it was booming. After two months of initial COVID shutdowns, those places exploded because everyone yeah, people- wanted to get out of their house, but they didn't want to be around strangers they didn't want to be in downtown at a bar uh, but they could not stand working from home that they haven't done it ever right with kids so they're like let's just go do a staycation somewhere Mm -hmm. so there was not enough supply to keep up with demand in those types of markets and we made a fortune in gatlinburg and provided a really cool uh, unique experience um, to the traditional cabins out there uh, and gatlinburg is you're based out of nashville correct I lived in Nashville for about two and a half years, and we okay. set up our Nashville properties in the two Gatlinburg ones while we lived in Nashville, but currently I live in Greenville, South Carolina. Oh, Greenville's so pretty. I vacation yeah. in South Carolina every year. I love it. Um, nice. So talk a little bit about the the investment properties you have that you, you, 
they're not where you live, um, how you decided to go out of state, why you decided to go out of state, um, and what, because I, I imagine you probably use a property management company, but a little bit about that. And I think a lot of times uh, people go into this financial independence idea thinking, well, if I do everything myself, then I'm going to make the most money and save the most money. Um, but there, I think there's definitely times where spending money makes you more. And it sounds like that may be the case for you with like the property management situations. Yeah. So this might be contrary to what a lot of people think. We self-managed for the first three years um, and we still kind of pseudo self manage I actually built, co-founded a property management company. So now my team manage it kind of at cost for me. But mm -hmm. um, but until then, yeah. So we made like the first four properties to in Asheville, to in Gallenberg. We traveled in a camper van for the next year managing four properties from our phone. We didn't even have a VA at the time, nothing. And we automated most of it through tech, through software. So automate 90% of the guest messaging, the typical messages, your calendar syncing with your cleaner. So the cleaner show, know when to show up. Um, they know when cancellations occur, so on and so forth. And then like have a handyman service. So like mm -hmm. 30 to 60 minutes a week per property, give or take. And it's pretty amazing the amount of money we did save because with short-term rentals, the revenue can be substantial. Um, in 2022, I think we brought in just shy of $900,000 gross between six properties, two of those we launched in April and May. Um, and if we were paying 20 to 25%, which is standard for the vacation rental industry, you're looking at 200 or no, more than that, right? I mean, we're like hundreds of thousands of dollars that we saved by just leveraging cheap software products mm -hmm. and spending a little bit of time each week. Now to your point, eventually you're going to want to outsource because it, it can get busy. Airbnb can be an active business. Um, so once you get past that, like five to six property, either you're going to have to hire VAs or have someone on staff or outsource to a, a full blown. When you PM. say VA, what does that mean? Virtual assistant. So okay. Yeah, there's actually a lot of virtual assistant uh, or c people or companies uh, that are uh, international. So a lot that are experienced in not just Airbnb and Verbo, but the property management softwares that people use. There, a lot of them are ex Airbnb employees, uh, as far as like support staff is, and they are they know how to communicate with guests and they speak really good English. And it's cheaper labor, so a lot of people will opt for a VA where you can just have them do some of the day-to-day -day operational tasks, mostly the time-consuming stuff, communicate with cleaners and guests. Mm -hmm. And you can teach them how to do pricing even, but it's like five to eight bucks an hour um, to use most of the, the VAs over there. For the virtual, that's interesting. Um, Cause we've got, I, I have like, uh, we have 11 employees and Charlotte Hall is the biggest property um, I've ever done. And it's on Airbnb um, as well as Peer Space. I'm interested to ask you about that too. Cause that's, learned more about that in the last six months um and one of our employees spends about 10 hours a week that's what we allot for her to do all the messaging for that property as well as one we've had since season two of the show that we actually did on the show um, and the 10 hours seems to be sufficient but if i pop in and see how many times people message and ask redundant questions and questions that you know have the information right there um it's a lot so you had someone a virtual assistant managing kind of like the cleaning handyman messaging communications now we do okay. with our management company but for the first three years it was just my wife and i okay. so we just kind of doubled it there are ways to mitigate some of the uh, the questions that become repetitive um in the listing or in the in, like we do send relatively lengthy messages when someone books check in house rules check out instructions mm -hmm. And then in the house, we have things posted on the walls. Like we, we really try and leave no doubt. And then a, yeah, a digital your Wi-Fi code too. is yes. for the 12th yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. So to eliminate, and there's actually software out there that, you know, more or less like the term AI, but um, essentially learns uh, yeah, chat with you. GPT. There's tech out there. Yeah, That's chat. Crazy. Exactly. So you can use stuff like that where it's, if a guest asks about Wi-Fi or early check-in, it's like a canned response, like, but they make it sound like superhuman and you could leverage tech like that too. So it's pretty amazing at what you can do with technology and software that enables you to continue to self-manage uh, at For scale. For someone who I, I'm not wildly tech savvy, but I'm probably more than a good chunk of people as well. For someone who is like, well, I, I, I can, I've been in property management as a, you know, a leasing agent, but I'm not good at tech. What would be a good, um, like resource for people to start learning about the kind of things that they can leverage to work smarter, not harder. Yeah. Honestly, just being someone who posts a lot of content on social media, I share 
like a ton of information, like follow, follow people that are experts in the field that you're interested in Mm -hmm. and see what tech, see if they're willing to share what tech they use, put a message or a comment on one of their videos. A lot of people respond or their team does. And then you can go on YouTube and, or even these companies, for example, like Price Labs or Real House, they have full blown demos of how to use the tool and leverage it and, Mm -hmm. and the price. And, um, so they make these tools in a way where they're not super clunky like they used to be like they're pretty user friendly to where even if you weren't tech savvy i feel like you could go watch a demo or even if you pay someone for mentorship that shows Mm -hmm. you how to do it and then from then on it's not that hard it's kind of set it and forget it and make tweaks along the way yeah so my question um which the reason i uh, started learning about peer space um is because when COVID hit the airbnb event policy seems confusing and um misaligned so there's the box that you can check that says you know you do or you don't allow events but since covid they say across the board no events no events are allowed um what have you seen i mean you're probably way more into the depths of the legalese around it and but what yeah so we don't really allow events and it depends also where you're located because the cities or municipalities are likely have Uh, especially in urban areas, have occupancy restrictions, among other things, uh, through their permit requirements to operate as a short-term rental. Um, But we do well enough just on Airbnb and Verbo, and we're going to do some direct bookings here in the near future as well, that we uh, tend to not allow events, uh, Mm -hmm. typically with more people, more problems in a lot of cases. Um, However, if it's a more structured event, I'm actually not familiar with uh, pure space or pure stay whatever you just said I'm uh sure. pure I'm space it's that. like airbnb but um you can book it if you want to uh you know film a, a commercial or do nice. a boudoir photo shoot or uh you know you wanted to go in and do um a clothing shoot like really anything it's just more the business end of it uh, if you wanted to rent something to have a business meeting yeah that's really cool we've actually had we've actually done that through airbnb in the past but usually we're a little we ask a lot of questions, but that's really neat. Maybe we'll look into that for a couple of our properties because we've asked for small weddings. We've had we've had a, sh- a strip dancing exercise class, oh. online class, film a film a commercial or like take. Do they bring in, in their own units. poles? Yes, and I was like, as long as you don't bolt anything or yeah, damage, just the don't ceilings, damage the ceiling, damage the floors or it. the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, she's like, no, 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 it's all good. Don't worry. And I was like, all right, cool. The, the, have fun you know and and so interesting make sure that like a ton of people don't show up but like that was cool and then we've had other people ask to like film random commercials or content or or, i don't know just random stuff and yeah sure as long as there's not more than x amount of people there i'm good with it yeah so what do you think uh you and your wife have been able to do with your short-term rentals that are that do set them apart from the other ones because there's so many property listings now. I mean, even in the probably half mile around where I'm sitting right now, there's 30. So how do you, if you're going to get into this, make yours different, better, ideally the best and market it the best? For sure. Yeah. A lot goes into the market research up front. So leveraging data in the marketplace has really helped us. Uh, tools like AirDNA, I kind of live and die by, and it's not necessarily Air DNA. Only... Yes. What's you know, that? you got to check it out. So okay. it's basically, they have hooks into... I guess, I don't know if it's an API connection or something or another with, with Airbnb and Verbo, and they have the historical occupancy and daily rate trends. And you can use filters to look at, I want to look at the historical month to month occupancy percentages and daily rates for two bedroom properties that sleep four to six people in this zip code. And it's really helpful to understand historical trends and pacing for future booking information. But the most important thing for me is to look at the supply in a market on an overview page. If you look at like the Smoky Mountains, you know, everyone and their mother wants to invest there. And then with the boom, you know, post COVID travel boom, uh, supply has gone up like 60 or 70 percent there, which is nuts. And Mm -hmm. will demand keep up with it? I don't know. I think it'll kind of level itself out over time. But if you look at a place like Nashville, where there was more restrictions uh, implemented this past year in 2022, and uh, a lot of people dumped their short-term rentals when COVID hit because they didn't see the way out of it. Um, supply is about the same as what it was pre-COVID and demand is rampant. Mm-hmm. So like that's the type of information you need. But to answer your question a little bit further, I go on the top property section. They show you the top properties and it's not always perfectly accurate, but a rough amount of what their revenue is per year and daily rate is. So I can see one, where they're located, 
because I want to know in a market I've never been to like Fort Lauderdale. I went under contract from like Texas on our camper van. Like I had never yeah. been there before, but I was like, I know I want a property within like a quarter mile of this radius and I want it to have a water feature like a pool. And I want to have something that either has or has the ability for me to build or add an outdoor like kitchen and pergola mm -hmm. type thing. So understanding what the top properties currently have, what amenities they have, what design styles they have is a good starting point and then find a place that either has it or has the opportunity for me to add it. And then from there, it's like, okay, well, what cool features or amenities like Instagrammable moments I'm big on. Um, I want to sell someone so hard on that first photo, like they have to click on it. They can't not learn more about the property because mm -hmm. uh, we live in a digital age. You're scrolling through thousands of properties in a market, yeah. just like TikTok or Instagram. You know, eventually like it's like a two second attention span. If I don't catch your attention, you're not going to click. You're not going to care onto the next one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like social media from that standpoint. But once they click, they get to your splash page, which is five photos. That's where you have to earn, earn them. I see too many people make the mistake. They have a beautiful home with a hot tub, an outdoor kitchen, a fire pit. But I didn't even know they had that until I get to the 50th photo. It's like, why is that? It's five photos of like the front of their house at different angles. I'm like, you yeah. guys are not selling it's people. It's just the order that they set them in. Like are the order that if you were going to do a real, list, real estate listing, it's like the mm -hmm. order you would walk through your house is typically exactly. how you see it. Yeah. So I usually think of it like a wow factor or an X factor. Like what is, if, if nothing else, what is one reason that someone's like, I could see myself there having an amazing time right now. Or if there's a moment, like our first ever one, was in Nashville, Tennessee, we put a mural, like an interactive mural with butterfly wings that says Nashville written above it because we're catering to bachelorette parties. And the reason we did that is there's murals all over Nashville, like a lot of cities now, but they're, they're all interactive. I've seen hundreds of people line up on a Saturday morning and spend hours waiting to take one photo to post on Instagram. Like so where like, you stand in front of a wall that has wings that end up on yes. your body. Gotcha. Exactly. And, and a couple celebrities had taken those photos and, and just went nuts. And I've Someone, even one of my cousins was like, yeah, that's all I wanted to do when I went to Nashville. I just popped around all the murals and took photos. And I'm like, I can think of a lot of better things to do personally, but <laughs> there's clearly a demand for it. Yeah. And so we put that inside and we're getting like a thousand dollars a night standard on the weekends for bachelorette parties because they want that moment. They want that memory. They're willing to pay for a cool photo and memory that they could cherish forever. And so how many online. bedrooms are you talking with a thousand dollars a night in Nashville? Four. Four. four bedrooms okay. and it's not even downtown like if yeah. that if that place was downtown we'd be fifteen hundred dollars a night plus on yeah the weekends. pretty easy yeah that's i so, mean yeah. that's so it sounds like i mean what sets you apart from a lot of people that want to do it is you just did a lot of the work i think a lot of people want the easy money and it's not easy it's yeah. it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of research and with how quickly everything is changing you don't get to like stop learning and stop changing your business. Um, I think the other question is because for me, my investments are to be able to, you again, you're doing this way better than me and you're a lot younger than me. I graduated college in 2007, but I think the idea is to be able to have more freedom in your life. And I'm like, oh, I'll have it eventually once I do X, Y, Z. You have it now. Like you lived in a camper for a year, which sounds amazing. So what is what was your plan from the beginning with what you wanted to do with your profits? Are you reinvesting? Are you putting some away? Um, like what's what was your goal long term and short term, I yeah, guess? Yeah, I guess honestly, it was like financial freedom 10 years. That was our ultimate goal. And I was like, that was a stretch. And then once we got that first property, that's what opened my eyes. I was like, holy shit, this could happen in 12 months. Yeah. I, like I saw the I saw the path um, and it did. Um, but I guess the longer term vision is, um, uh, really like the three steps in my opinion to financial freedom. Level one is just having like your, your living expenses and, or your basic lifestyle covered through your passive income or residual income. And then level two is kind of like, Hey, I can live beyond my means a little bit. I could have a nice house. If I want a nice, I can drive a car. I can go out to a nice dinner without worrying about how much money is in my bank account. Um, and I can also like treat my friends, family to whatever level three is I could, you know, already live beyond my means, but I could give beyond my wildest just imagination, support causes that are meaningful to me and like make a greater impact on either my community or some, some area of the world. So mm -hmm. like that ultimately is, I think what my wife and I are after is that level three, because that's, yeah. what's going to give us deeper purpose and meaning. Um, right now we're, we're in level two and we're continuing to reinvest a ton. Um, but our goals are a little bit different. We talk about like it more of an end state of being versus an end goal. Like mm -hmm. I used to set a lot of end goals. Like I want to lose this much weight by this date. 
okay, well, what happens when I do? And then I fall back into like the normal pattern, right? Yeah. Um, I don't need to just be like, hey, I want to be a billionaire because like I don't think I ever want that. But I think it's more of the state of being like the true financial freedom. Once you hit it, are you going to continue just to like go, 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 build, build, build? Mm -hmm. But then you forget about the whole purpose you started in the first place, which is to have your time back, travel, spend time with family, do whatever yeah. you want. So right now we're trying to find that balance, um, continuing to build and ride like this awesome wave we're on. Um, but if, at some point in the next maybe three to five years, I kind of want to like take a step back um, and take the foot off the gas pedal and just like really just live a kick-ass life and yeah. and help make that impact on, on other people or communities. I think uh, that I can definitely relate to that because particularly with the unique nature of like I was renovating and selling houses and, you know, doing okay. And then the show blew it up and... When that happened, I was like, yes, I'm going to jump on this ride. And I'm going to ride this ride until I get kicked off it, which, you know, in HGTV land is maybe like three seasons if you're lucky, if you even end up with a show. And now going into season eight, I'm like, OK, this is first of all, it's exhausting. Uh, it's fun and it's terrible and horrible and exhausting and a life suck. And my kids are two and four. And, you know, my husband's been able to take this great step where he did uh, a month ago. Um, he quit his job and has a personal training app and is doing really well. But now uh, trying to figure out that balance again. Okay, I said I was going to ride this till it was done, not by a choice of my own. Like once people get sick of me and they're not yet for some reason. So we are having those conversations again now. Like, okay, when do we choose? Because it seems bratty to be like, I'm going to quit TV. I'm just really tired of it and I want to go live on a beach <laughs> And not that we'll be doing that tomorrow by any means, but I think an important thing in the success is the conversations you're saying you're having with your wife and how those change and the check-in and, and the goal changes as you move through life. Um, and it, you don't have kids yet, right? Yeah, I have a three-month-old daughter. You have so a three-month-old? Congratulations. Mm -hmm. That changes yeah, shit, doesn't you. it? Ew, oh, yeah. It changes yeah. things. It changes your sleep. It changes now. But like just looking at her and seeing her smile back at you is just like that changes your life and yeah. it just changes perspective on life too. Yeah. Um, so certainly, yeah, it's just, now it's just like, I just want to watch her grow up, provide the best life possible for her and, and hopefully, you know, siblings in the future and yeah. be able to travel and like have life experiences together and not be so bought down in the go, go, go mode that I catch myself working 12 hour days, even though it's stuff I love doing but it defeated the whole purpose of why we yeah. started in the first place, which was to have eight to 10 hours during the day to do whatever we want and maybe work on some stuff. That's something again, that I've kind of, I'm kind of kicking myself in because my son's four and a half and we're at the point where I've decided, okay, like let's do more things. Let's travel. Let's, he loves everything safari. Like let's spend the money and go on a cool safari. And now he's in school. Granted, it's preschool, kindergarten, so I'll still make the choice to pull him out if we're going to do something cool. But I really, hindsight, you know, would have been great if I would have had the realization earlier on, like, while they're both not in school, let's do those things. Because when school starts, it's a whole new limiting factor. So uh, it sounds like you have a uh, better perspective already at this point. So that's awesome. And just wait till she's like six months. She really will start earning her keep because they like uh, laugh at you and you're like, oh I my God, I can't wait for great. her to belly laugh. I just uh, can't wait. It's so good. Yeah. My daughter is two and a half and she is just the funniest chick in the world and <laughs> a daddy's girl. So I'm sure, Aww. I'm sure you'll uh, enjoy that even more than you already are. Um, well, this has been, this was a little bit selfish of me. Obviously I get, you know, I get to pick who I have on here, but I, I, it's all been very interesting. Um, and hopefully for everyone that's listening, you know, not too complicated that there aren't some good takeaways. Um, but what would like, you know, is there anything that you haven't shared that was really life changing or helpful? Cause I feel like sometimes it's even like the most simple advice that, that kind of sticks with people. At least I've had that experience a couple of times. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure you've been able to get all your little nuggets of wisdom out for everybody. Yeah. Something that I probably learned way later than I should have was I always held my money and my cards tight to my chest. Um, and I wanted to like, if you want to done right, do it yourself type of thing. Like I need <laughs> to learn everything before getting going. And now I'm willing to, whether it's free or paid for coaching or mentorship, if it, if it's the right one, and the right fit for what you want to accomplish, 
trust me, it's worth paying for it because um, it, it will accelerate by 10 or 100x the speed at which it takes you to get to where you wanna go by having the blueprint in front of you and having an accountability person or coach um, that can help you get there. Um, you can even credit it to like a, a nutrition and exercise coach. Like if you just show up to a gym and you have no idea what you're doing every day and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to get in shape. Chances are you get in shape. Probably not. Unless you just start like David Goggins and you're like, fuck your feelings. Like I'm just getting go hard, get hard. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> it's like, it's not easy just to, to figure it out on your own. So that's just like at the simplest level, but for like business or investing, um, I feel like I, I used to, I, have put, purchased several programs at this point in my life, but early on, I really wish I found a mentor or paid for some type of program or mentorship because of the value that you would get and at the speed at which it would accelerate your journey to, again, what you're looking to accomplish. When I had um, the business coach suggested to me by my brother who had it paid for like at a corporate level because he was working for Google and, you know, Verily and all these great companies that provide those things. And I first chat with her and she said, what's your budget for this? My answer was nothing. I have no budget for this. Like, this isn't something that I've thought about enough. And th there isn't one. You tell me what you can do for me um, and I will figure it out how to make it work. And she worked with me, which is amazing. And I could not agree with you more that if I had thought about that early, earlier and valued it earlier, um, I, I found the money. I mean, you can find money in so many places. Give up the second Starbucks or the second energy drink or whatever it is. Um, and it was, it was huge and life changing. And I wish I had done it earlier. Um, I talk about her all the time. She's was, I, she was pretty much like a therapist and helped me be a better boss. Um, so yeah, I second that. Um, well, I, I want to make sure, like, tell everyone, because I, like I said, I stumbled across you on Instagram. You were one of my suggested follows, uh, and it was just super interesting. So if other people want to follow you, you post a ton of super educational content. You do mentoring programs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. give, give everyone all your information. So if they want to um, chat with you more or follow along with some of your stuff. Yeah. I mean, Instagram is usually the best place to reach out like via direct message. I think I respond to nearly a hundred percent of the people there. Um, but, uh, I do offer coaching mentorship. I've been doing it for about two years now, uh, with short-term rentals and Airbnb. Um, and I've coached over 900 people at this point in time. So it's been a really awesome journey seeing other people succeed and just take what I have like as a blueprint and replicate the success. And some people have actually surpassed what I'm doing. Um, which is pretty cool um, just to see. But I've, a lot of people have quit their jobs and do real estate full-time travel now, which like that is super fulfilling to me. There's a lot of ways to make money, but it's fulfilling to me uh, on that standpoint. Um, but yeah, I, I offer, and there's plenty of resources there. I won't bog, bog the podcast down with that. But if you guys want to learn about that or anything else like interior design, I'm a co-founder in a summer led designs. And then I have a property management company and we're about to launch a, a website called STR hub, which will be a great resource for people looking uh, to get into short-term rentals and learn how to evaluate properties and maybe even connect with realtors, um, from that standpoint too. So a lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on that blossomed from posting content on social media, really more or less, uh, the abundance mindset, which I like to tell people is like, there's enough success out there for everybody to share. And, and the more you share for free with people, the more you typically reap in re rewards long term. And I found that to be true the majority of the time. So I never had any intention of really making money with social media. I knew you could, but I was like, oh, I'll just try sharing. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's going to care to listen to me. And it was hard at first. But after I had a few videos do well, I was like, okay, I started to learn what to post, how to say it be open and transparent. And then all these other things just like blew up together along with it. Yeah. And it's just been really cool to, to have that, uh, journey and like be a part of it. Well, and I think with, you know, with anything in your life, um, it, when I found your page and even talking to you more now, as you were talking before you even said, like I say all the time, a rising tide floats all boats. And it is shocking how many people don't think that, um, they think if I give you something from me, whether it's my time, my knowledge, my money, then then I am going to be less than, or I'm going to set you up to be better than better than I am. And if you can teach someone and they can surpass you, I feel like you're a pretty badass teacher. Um, but not a lot of people have that mindset. And this has you know been an hour where we've chat, but I I think I'm you know a good read on people. You feel very genuine, and I think most of the people that are on social media. Um, and sharing their knowledge with people 
that happened to be there organically like you did um kind of like I was I was on Facebook and that's how I got the show that because it was organic to begin with it just feels it feels real it feels better because it was it wasn't you know you trying to be this person and present this image you're just being you and learning along the way um and so I think that's very cool and that you've been able to gain um a higher level of success in so many different ways but additionally financially and still maintain that balance of you know I'm I'm not too good to like help other people now is is really cool and I, I'm Midwest so we're all very friendly and not everyone's like that um so I just I appreciate that uh so I'm glad uh, I'm glad I um Instagram stalked you and you were willing to chat this has been super interesting um and thank you guys all for listening as well uh you can always submit more questions if you want to leave a voice message box, there is a link in the show notes. Some people are weird about leaving it with their own voice. You can always just send me a message too um, about anything, but um, follow-up ones for Michael. I'm, I'm sure we could do 10 more episodes about investing and financing and more specific things. So feel free to ask any of those as well. Um, and make sure you guys follow and, and share this with all your friends. And I'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.